All right. Welcome to the show. My guest today is Gabe Bentz. He's an engineer, innovator, and entrepreneur and future thinker. Uh, he is the CEO uh, of a few companies, including Slant3D. Um, we are going to talk about that. Uh, I've known this guy for a little while now, and we keep running into each other. Uh, and the last time we did, I asked him to come on to the podcast. Gabe, welcome to the podcast, brother. Hey, Jake. Thanks for having me here. Dude, how's the new year treating you, man? It's not terrible. I probably could complain, but I shouldn't. <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely, man. I uh, I last saw you at a at the end of the year. I hosted mm -hmm. a panel on supply chain. Yep. Um, and this was for uh, venturecapital.org, Rectify Partners. We're you know collaborating. We're talking about all the disruption in the world of supply chain and all these different things. And of course, you show up, mm -hmm. and you're, you're sitting there, and I'm like. God, this guy, like you're a supply chain kind of guy with, with yeah. some of the things that you're doing in the world. Um, could you, could you explain uh, the company that you own and run and the ecosystem around you? I'd, I'd love to get anchored in that before, before we dive in. Sure. Um, well, uh, yeah, with Slant 3D, what we're trying to do is basically build a warehouse where the shelves make the product in the warehouse. So you have infinite selection but no inventory. Yeah. Uh, and, and the way we're doing that is just by basically building out a warehouse and putting 3D printers on all of the shelves so that whenever somebody makes an order, it materializes out of thin air and then we throw it in a box and ship it to the end consumer. Yeah, so what, uh, <laughs> one, when, you, when you're saying a warehouse full of printers, and I actually, uh, we did a video together out Jake's, I'll link it into this podcast. If anyone wants to see uh, some of the process and Gabe talking about his business and some of those things we have collaborated uh, in that way uh, together. But for folks who are kind of new to the idea of additive manufacturing at scale, <laughs> which is for most of the world, I'm sure. Um, they, like, let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about like, what is a warehouse full of 3D printers and why is that, why is that lucrative or why is that interesting for businesses? It's, um, well, it's most interesting mainly because you eliminate all of the previous supply chain and logistics for making a product. So 10 years ago, if you wanted to make a spatula or some kind of a widget, first thing you would do is you drop 50 grand for a mold over in China, and then you'd have 10,000 or 100,000 of them made. They'd be shipped over on a boat over to here, and then they'd sit in a warehouse for five years, and you hope that you sell them all at the end of it all, um, which very often doesn't happen because 99% yeah. of fit businesses fail. Um, but with 3D printing, um, what we've done is try to replace the mold, the boat, the warehouse with just thousands of small 3D printers that each make one part at a time. Um, and then when a person wants 10,000 parts or just has an order come in, a machine fires up and grows the part without needing any tools, without needing any shipping or any kind of setup. The machine can just make basically anything. Um, and that allows us to, with having those thousand machines, lets us make the 10,000 parts and operate at a scale where you can produce for large uh, customer segments. But it just eliminates all that previous supply chain because instead of having the boat, the train, the planes, trains, and automobiles moving stuff around and storing big numbers of things, you just have a large number of individual machines that can produce parts on demand. You know, 3D printing is like a, uh, when it started, uh, at least at the consumer or at the, the private level, you know, you mm -hmm. go out and buy a 3D printer. Right. My perception of 3D printers early on was shaped by that process where it's like a lot of knickknacks and things yeah, and like, you know, people get kind of a cool idea. You kind of had to be a bit technically savvy to play around in some of the programs, at least conceptually until like some of these right. kind of file shares and things started popping up and people open sourcing mm -hmm. their code uh, for it or whatever. But like, there's some real like practical items that are being there created. totally is, but there's still plenty of the cheap crap wandering around. And that's, <laughs> I was not a fan of 3D printing ever until about three or four years ago when this whole thing got started because okay. I hated that part about it. Bunch of guys in their garage making crappy plastic crap. Um, that ends up just, in a landfill one day. And like, right, exactly. Yeah, they, it, It's like, I look, made this awesome Yoda head, but now, and it took me all weekend and 10 bucks of material and all this effort, but <laughs> I think I'm sticking it to the man, but I could have bought it for 99 cents and had one day delivery on Amazon. 
back in those days. I guess one day delivery isn't really a thing anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it opened up so a world kind of, of like, uh, like, uh, customization or personalization, I guess, for, for items. Like if you wanted yeah. to, if you were savvy enough to put somebody's name on something or like build something that's uh, interesting to them, a little keychain or key ring or something like that. Like there was right. opportunities in that, but like, what are some of the things that you guys are, can you share some of the stuff that you're printing uh, now? Yeah. And have, like what, what kind of items are going through your factory? A lot of succulent pots right at the moment. <laughs> succulent pots <laughs> succulent pots it's been really interesting um we we've been working with consumer goods for a while and that kind of thing but just very recently we got a couple of partnerships um with companies that do like amazon stores and that kind of thing and succulent pots are something they wanted to pursue um so that's kind of been the thing for the new year as they came off of christmas they wanted to get this launched here for the new year so succulent pots are a big one. And we also, at the same time, had a similar project coming through. So there, there's planters wandering around all over the place in the factory right now. Um, because yeah, they've just been a, a perfect little fit for this because you get infinite variation. They launched like 200 SKUs in a day. Um, and again, yeah, they didn't have to make any of them until somebody actually orders them. Oh, that's beautiful. So it's been pretty nifty. So explain 3D printing to people who don't understand 3D printing. 3D printing is when you take some object, some block or whatever it happens to be, and then you just cut it into layers, slice it up into basically paper thin layers, and then you stack those layers on top of each other. Um, so what you would do is you would create a 3D model of whatever you've got, some uh, yeah, sculpt it out somehow in some computer or grab some engineer to get it done for you. And then you send that model to the printer and it builds it up those paper thin layers at a time until you grow out the part. Um, that's the simplest way I have of doing it. There's a lot of different processes, but that's the fundamental idea is just cutting it into layers. Yeah. And so like, then it's like, what is the actual, so it's plastic primarily that comes out of these things, but like, what are, what are people using to 3d print? Like I see videos of people like 3d printing houses. I know that's not necessarily right. what you're doing in your factory uh, or your, your warehouse or whatever you call mm -hmm. it, but like, what's the application in, in the world? I mean, let's just like zoom all the way out. Like what are people 3d printing right now? Everything that they possibly can. Yeah. The houses are a great example um because they're they're fixing the labor shortage um you can't find a framer anymore so you just build a big old robot that can lay down concrete fast enough to put up a house um those are actually fascinating because the biggest challenge with those has not been the machine at all it's been the material uh concrete that holds its shape as you put down a bead of it as you're growing this house was really tough for those guys for a long time um but yeah as far as what could be 3d printed Right now, it's pretty much everything. Um, the only limitation has been kind of change in design practices because people have always designed for injection molding. But if you try to 3D print like an injection mold or cast part or anything like that, any traditional process type of part, um, you're going to have a tougher time of it and it won't be a very good part. The 3D print part would be inferior. So there's a, an education gap that's kind of happened right now of okay, we have this application, but we don't think we can use 3D printing because when we've printed stuff in the past, it hasn't been very good. But if we change the design so that it's optimized for that process, then it can be printed. Um, and that's kind of a, a hump that the 3D printing industry is getting over. Just people getting used to the idea of using that process in its optimal way. A, a really good example about this is Back when electric motors first came out, they were replacing steam engines because that was the main form of power in like factories. So you'd have these giant steam engines inside of a factory that have belts and pulleys rolling down to all the drill presses and different machines inside the factory. When electric motors came out, they just made a great big electric motor and put it in the slot of the steam engine, which was fine. That was an easy way to get people transferred over. But then after about 10, 20, 50 years, people realized, oh, we can make tiny little electric motors, put them on each one of the machines and just run wires. Then we don't have this pulley and cabling system up and down the factory and the factory doesn't have to be built around the steam engine. You put the tools wherever you want to and you can build an assembly line. Um, so that's a similar kind of transition. It, there are people are trying to slot it into the old thing style. But if you optimize for what the new thing is really good at, you can get a whole different paradigm. 
And so when we're talking about 3D printing out of your, out of slant 3D, I mean, we're talking about a couple thousand parts a month, 10,000 10, parts, a, like what, what's coming off your lines out there? 10 to 30,000 parts a week right now is Damn. what we're producing. Yeah. That's, uh, a, that's, that's a lot of, of coil or whatever. What, yeah. do you, what do you call that stuff? It's a lot of, a lot of filament. filament. Yeah. 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 It's, it's been a crazy ride there. Um, and yeah, getting to that number has been really, really tough just because of like the biggest challenge with 3d printing historically, when we started the company was the fact that it just wasn't scalable. You couldn't make 10,000 parts, even if you tried, even if you had a hundred printers or a thousand printers, because there was so much labor involved of, a part gets done, somebody goes, plucks it off the machine, and then you go start up another part. What we did when we got started was just to redesign the machines completely so that they could just do a very simple auto ejection. So when a part was done, the machine removes it and then it moves on to the next part. So now you actually have true 24 seven operation um, without having to have a human handhold the machine the whole time. Well, how how do you do that? Is that something that's available out in the market? Did 3D printers come with that? Do you have to build that? I haven't seen a consumer or commercial application that does that yet. Um, the, the print farms out there that are being built are generally like a robot arm that runs to the machine, pulls off the part, and then takes it back, which has its place, um, but it's still not very scalable. Um, the reason we had to build it ourselves was just because print farms are few and far between. Uh, and the ones that exist are mainly like within 3D printer manufacturers themselves. So they're 3D printing their 3D printers. Uh, that's the only other farm that's comparable in size to ours because since there's been, uh, I, I, I can't speak to the reasons why other people haven't done it, um, but it was a uh, print farms just aren't a common business practice. So they're not a market force that machine manufacturers would start catering to on a product design basis. So they're like, there's no printer farms out there. We're not going to make a printer farm machine because we're not going to sell any to anybody. There's this one guy in Idaho who's diddling around, um, yeah. but he's not worth building a whole new device for. So that's kind of the reason we had to build stuff from scratch, just because there's the utilization of 3D printing hasn't been high enough to justify a machine manufacturer making a different machine. Oh, got it. Got it. Yeah. So it is, it is primarily the folks that they're selling it to are either like consumers. large specific commercial applications or small consumer. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the big monstrous prototyping machines or yeah, the, the, yeah. the fun machines in the garage you know, that are like a bandsaw. I've seen some of those uh, uh, that are like print with medical grade plastic. Yeah. That's cool. I've seen the ones that you like, there's like a, it's almost looks like a printer toner. That, yeah. like, smashes things together. Like, do you know anything about like that part? Of the, could you educate me on that? The, the medical grade stuff is just making a really precise, expensive machine, but it still uses kind of common practices. Very often what those do, they're, they're called resin machines. Very often what those parts are. And basically you have a, a bucket, of, a tub of resin, um, and then you run a laser over it, which drying out the pattern of that slice of the part. And then that resin hardens and you move down to the next layer. It's basically like, the, you know, Terminator 2, when that Terminator is growing out of a puddle. Yeah. That's basically what that type of 3D printing is. Oh, man. Is you doomed. just have a bunch we're of doomed. liquid and it turns into a thing. Totally, we're, right? We're doomed. That's... <laughs> We've had the technology forever. It's was just it... a matter of time. Well, it's, yeah, yeah. So it was a Sarah Connor or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're screwed, man. Well, I got the Herkinator, <laughs> man. I'm, that's the lot. Oh, uh, nice. The logo, yeah. the logo to the podcast, man, it's a, it's a half stoic and then half like impending doom. Um, <laughs> like, and you know, you're, you're, you know, with, um, you know, 3d printing for me, like kind of straddles that, that world. Like what a fantastic innovation, mm -hmm. what a way to eliminate so much waste in like mm -hmm. transportation and dunnage and like all the different things associated with, um, uh, making like buying something in China, shipping in a container, especially a container, what they cost right now. I mean, yeah. it used to be like seven, eight grand a container. Now it's like 26, 30 grand a container. Yeah. Oh, and it's it, just a small bump. Yeah. Come small on. bump. And you're not going to get it for like three to four months. Right. <laughs> and like, there's all these like issues that go along with it. And it's like, man, if I could just print that in my backyard with 
you know, my printer farm, that'd be really neat. Exactly. Um, but like, what are the limitations today? Like what, like for skilled manufacturing and what you are doing, like what are the types of items that you couldn't necessarily do? Anything with metal? Can you do stuff with metal? We don't, but people are. Uh, oh, okay. There's a lot of really interesting work being done in metal right now. Um, but it's, it's still trying to cross that gap of like, it's a good idea and we theoretically know how to do it, but the practicality of it is still kind of coming together. Mm. Um, cause metal 3d printing in any sort of real commercial sense or large scale is only really about five years old, uh, which is young, young, young. Yeah. Um, and the, the challenge that they've had over there is really kind of the final processing of the metal. Because when they ba- when they make metal, they basically glue together a bunch of uh, medical metal uh, metal particles, uh, and then they put it in an oven, and then all those particles melt, and the part hardens itself together and melts itself together. Um, because that yeah, so that challenge of cooking the part after they print the part has been really tough. Because as soon as the shape of the part changes, the cooking recipe or how long you leave it in the oven changes. Mm. And then if you put a hundred parts in that oven, then it changes again. And then if somebody twists one part the wrong direction, it changes again. So that infinite variability of how to center is what it's called, center these parts together um, has been really tough for those guys. Um, But it's coming along and they'll get it figured out. And as you get into more mass production where every part is the same, it's easier to justify that oven because it's kind of like, okay, we set up our recipe that we put 100 parts in there. It basically becomes a mold inside the oven. That's our set system that you shove all the parts into. They all get cooked and they're all reliable when they come out. Just like any manufacturing, you're reducing variability, right? You just have to drive. You have to just create standards and and do something with consistency and then scale accordingly. Yep, exactly. Um, for our side, the thing that we fight with, most of our stuff is kind of logistical or just, yeah, the, the, the organization of it all. Because we use FDM printers, which are a hot nozzle squirting out a, a lot Vita plastic, just like those big old concrete printers, only small and with a hot, hot glue gun rather than concrete. Um, but with those printers, they've pretty much kind of maxed out technologically. Um, on the mechanical and design side. We're not gonna make them more precise. We're not gonna make them magically super smooth or anything like that. Um, so for us, the, the optimization is in how do we get material in there? How do we operate and organize those machines? How do we create an efficient system mm. with that core cell inside of it? Um, and that's been a challenge too, just because again, since we're such an odd duck inside the market, cause there aren't a lot of printer farms out there we got to build everything from scratch and there's not very many off the shelf things where we can say, yeah, we want that guy to give us our printers. We want that guy to give us our raw materials. Um, we pretty much have to go all from scratch just because there's nobody out there catering to us. All right. I need an origin story. I, I, I need to know why you decided to, to open this. So I know you were an engineer before working on some robotic stuff and maybe take us through Take us through that trajectory. Like, were you always fascinated with shit like this when you were a kid, or like what? Yeah, like, yeah. Take 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 me on that journey. Uh, I grew up on a cattle ranch in Eastern Oregon, town of a hundred people, one room schoolhouse. What, so there's what? no reason at all I should have become an engineer. What, what <laughs> town was that? Uh, uh, Burns, Oregon. You're from Burns. Burns. Burns is the big city. I'm out from one of the the, the suburbs, fifty miles out from the side there. Oh wow. <laughs> Yeah, it's a small, small town. Um, But yeah, both my parents were ranchers and I'm uh, one of a family of five. But uh, growing up, I I did always like the robots more than riding the house or riding the the horses. Um, I think like the inciting in. Did you ever watch the old like 1960s Lost in Space? Oh, you bet. That robot was the coolest thing ever and still is. I don't care if it's a guy in a suit. That robot was like, yeah, that thing right was that there. The, was that the danger, danger, Will Robinson? Yeah. Yeah, totally. yeah, yeah. The old bubblehead one. Yep. With the, yeah, the claws and the dryer pipe arms. Yeah. Awesome yeah. robot. Um, but that thing was like, yeah, right there. That's the thing I want to do. Uh, when I was like five or something, I saw the old black and white episode or whatever it was. And that was like, yeah, robots are sick thing. Um, so I, I did do robots basically from that point forward. I think I wanted to be a dentist for like one year or something, but that phase passed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, 
but yeah, I went to, I ended up going to engineering school uh, at Embry Riddle uh, down in Prescott, Arizona. And they are an aerospace school for the most part. So when I came out, I was qualified to build Mars rovers. So of course, the very first thing I did when I came out was I started designing toys. Um, and we, the, the company that I ran at that point was a product design firm. So we did a lot of toys and engineering consulting work for people. Um, and we did some kind of vanity robotics projects for ourselves where we were like, okay, how far could we go? Um, and we did some really cool stuff, but out of that company, we created a series of little robotic arms, little STEM kits for kids, um, where they could build a robot arm and make it move and do whatever they happen to do. Um, when we built those arms, we designed them with 3D printing. This was like five years ago. We didn't think we were gonna sell more than like a hundred sets of these things. And then we'd move on to the next project. A little more successful than that. So we ended up having to build a print farm to produce these little robot arms. And out that print farm was the most terrible, horrible thing ever. I hated it so much. <laughs> it was just hot How do you really feel garbage. about it? Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh man, I was just like, yeah, this is garbage. Uh, exactly. I, I was against the project from the beginning too. I'm like, I don't want to do 3D printing. Don't want to do a 3D printed product, but the guys got me to do it. And then I was like, yep, see printer farm garbage. Um, this is why we don't do this. But as we were working with it, the reasons it was garbage and the reason 3D printing wasn't scalable and why it was so irritating and everything else appeared very fixable hmm. um, just by changing the machine. Cause we're like, you do this and it's a little handier there. And then you get a ton of them. If you got 10 machines right here, but it, uh, one guy could probably run a hundred of these if they don't break down all the time. So now you have, you can put together a thousand machines with 10 guys running it. The economics works. You're making a thousand parts an hour. That's scalable. That's interesting. There, there was an engineering path to getting to mass production with 3d printing, which I had never seen before. Um, when we realized the math works out 3d printing could cost as much as injection molding and make just as many parts um because if, if you look at it at a very basic level they have the same inputs you put in heat and electricity and plastic and out comes a plastic part in a mold and you put in heat electricity and plastic on a 3d printed part and out comes a 3d printed part the only reason printing was too expensive was there because there were too many humans touching it the whole time as opposed to a mold that just makes cranks out 50,000 parts and the machine breaks down twice a year. Um, so knowing that they had the same inputs, but somehow 3D printing had something broken, we could focus on what was broken and get rid of it so that it could be a production process. So we started building out the printer farm for our own products. We designed our first version of the, the production machine and tested that out and that was working pretty well. Um, and then we started having excess capacity on that print farm. And we were like, well, we'll sell that off to other people because other people surely want to make something for their Etsy store, or their business or some bracket that's hidden inside of a box. So we started selling off capacity and making parts for people. Uh, and then it became very clear that that business was growing way faster than the product design and engineering business. So we spun it out and I came over and started running Slant 3D full time. Um, and that's kind of how it came to be. We, still, we got stuck with it and then we figured out a way to fix it. Are you still doing the STEM kits and robots and things like that? That project actually got deactivated about a year ago because of supply chain stuff. It was just too much of a hassle to get the same servos in every month the way we liked. Um, oh, man, manufacturing sucks so much if you're using five different people to supply your parts and pieces. Yeah. I remember... The reason we like those kits and having them printed so much is that since it was still low volume, even though we were making a couple thousand of them at a time, um, it was so low volume that each time we would order the raw components like servos or the chips, it was always servos. They would like change the mold or change their, the distributor would change their supplier of the same servo by number, part number but it'd be just a little bit different. The tolerances would be off or it'd be a little bit wider or shorter. So we'd have to change the design of the arm basically every time we got a new batch of servos in to fit the new freaking servos. So that got even worse at COVID of course. So the whole project was just shut down. Okay. 
but yeah, through th those arms, I think we did 10 successful Kickstarters and yeah, 10 separate kits or whatever it was as part of that project. It was pretty fun. So your, uh, your print farm today, I mean, you said like a thousand printers plus like. We haven't hit a thousand yet, okay. um, but we actually are right now working on a deal to reserve a space that will be able to hold 2000 machines when we're all done building it out. Okay. So you got plans for growth right now. Like we got plans. How, how do you, how do you de-risk your supply chain with like getting these printers and getting these, uh, the filament and like all the things that you need from a material standpoint to, uh, to run this. In building these machines, we were able to drive them towards the most basic type of a box that you could possibly get a hold of. So when you say building machines, you're you're physically building the 3D printers. Yeah, we manufacture and yeah, put together all of our own machines. Okay. Um, but so by doing that, we were able to have just the most basic kind of components. So we're like, send us 50 feet of aluminum extrusion and we can cut it into the chunks that we need and then shove it into the 3D printed parts that make the 3D printers. So about 60% of the part count is 3D printed. So we control that part of the supply chain. The other part is chips and electronics. So you have robots but, making robots and you're- Yeah, we do. Yeah. It's the okay. end of the world right there. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's all right. I'm sleep well. Um, but uh, yeah, so the only thing that we don't really control in the design of the machine or the manufacturer of the machine is like the chips on it, which has become a problem, but mainly more of kind of a budgeting and cost problem than really supply problem. Because the stuff that we use is fairly low grade in the context of computer chips. Um, so it hasn't been an issue yet. And again, since we hold, have control of our own design, if some part of our supply chain breaks down, we're able to swap over the design and move to somebody else who can give us the chip. This actually literally just happened. We're working on the version 13 of our machine and we found out that a hot plate on each one of our machines, we have a heated build surface that everything grows off of. The guys who made our original plate went out of business and basically no one else is making that plate anymore. So there's not a backup. So we are changing kind of the fundamental structure of the machine to accommodate a different size plate from different manufacturers so that we're upgraded with what the industry is doing. So we're able to basically steal the plates off of all the manufacturers who make consumer machines buy them from these five different guys, hopefully for the next couple of years and put them on our machines. So since we have control of our machine and manufacturing, we're able to switch it around and address that disruption. Yeah. And, easily. In, and in a high, you know, you're in a high tech world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's innovating fast. Like obsolescence is probably top of mind. It sounds like you're, you're getting an opportunity to uh, swap some things out, but are you concerned with obsolescence at all? Not as much as most people would think because we're more concerned about product consistency over time. If we have a manufacturer who comes to us and wants to make a bracket for the dashboard of their car, we wanna make sure that the part we make today is exactly the same as the part we make five years from now. So that means our machines are, can't go out of date for at least three to five years. And if we make new machines, they have to be backwards compatible perfectly. So there's a slower cycle of obsolescence there. And when we decided to build the print farm, we looked at all the technologies that were available and we picked the one that had been around the longest, FDM, which is the hot nozzle squirt now plastic. That one has been around since 1985. It's pretty settled. It's pretty established as far as technologies go, especially mechanical technologies. So the only thing that would kind of upgrade is the chips, but we're moving around a tool. It only gets so precise and we don't need 27 decimal places after the main point to get a precise enough machine because the mechanics of the machine can't get any better. So once you've, if you get down to just a brick, you can't get much better than a brick if what you need is a brick. That's about as simple and clean as it gets. Mm -hmm. So we tried to engineer down to the simplest basic thing to where, yeah, there's some optimizations we can do here and there and yonder, but the machines mechanically are just about as good as they're going to get. So obsolescence isn't that big of a deal. Gotcha. When, from a, 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 let me shift gears here for a second. From a, uh, from just an individual standpoint, like I'm interested in 3D printing. 
I've got an eight year old son, six year old daughter. They're interested too. Like, dude, lay, lay it out here. How might somebody start? I mean, you, you obviously went through a deep discovery process, but like, let's get detailed here. There's like the world that we're going to inevitably is going to be, it, it, it's going to have a, a 3d printing is going to be a component of it, at least for the next part of the foreseeable future. How mm-hmm. might we as laymen start to understand more or tinker with and start to play and, and demystify some of this? I would say like fundamentally 3d printing you could get into 3D printing by band, buying a bandsaw or buying a CNC mill or buying a hammer and a nail. Just learning how to build real stuff mm. will inform you very greatly in how to make real stuff with a printer. It's just a different tool in making real stuff. Um, and there's very few people, well, decreasing numbers of people who know how to make real stuff. So that's the best in because people can understand, oh, do I like making and creating things? And then the necessity to like learn CAD and your learn printing on its own comes from that. Just the same way you'd learn to use a CNC machine if you were a machinist and you like making parts or whatever it was with the bandsaw. It grows into itself. But for printing specifically, um, you gotta know why, how to make- Which is why these like STEM kits things like that seem they're pretty important then of like sitting down and like actually going through the process of building or what's your perspective on that? I don't like STEM very much, quite bluntly. Oh, um, dude, let's go here. Right now. <laughs> um, STEM has always been focused on code and even the robot kits or whatever it was. Sure. You build it for 15 minutes, but then it's all about programming the robot and learning how to write code, which is fine but it takes the perspective of everybody needs to have a complete and in-depth knowledge of code and in order to survive because our world's all digital, which is wrong because we've all been driving cars for the last hundred years and most people don't know how to change their oil. So obviously you don't need it to survive, even though you need a car to survive. Um, STEM is really, really overhyped and it's created a, a, People are focusing so heavily on STEM that a school will buy 50 iPads to try to teach kids code rather than building a wood shop so that the kids who are not gonna learn how to code because code sucks for a lot of people. It's miserable if you're not a coder. So the five kids out of the whole, exactly. See, me too. I had to code. I'm not particularly enjoying it. Yeah. Um, But since there's such this focus on code, they try to shove all the kids into it, even though some kids would want to build stuff with their hands or something like that, or go write a book or do something else that's useful in the world. Um, but there's this focus on STEM and code and artistic and finding yourself and everything else, stuff that can be done on an iPad, which is super easy and easy to design apps for. But it's, it's we don't, we need a lot more good engineers, sure. But you're not going to force a bunch of people to be new good engineers. And you need a lot more people who can build stuff and do things that are useful. Um, And my personal thing is that I think we've left the trades behind because they're perfectly good kinds of jobs and careers. Um, And we focus so heavily on STEM, even though 90% of people are never gonna be involved in a STEM career. Um, And knowing about it is not terribly helpful, especially if the kid is miserable the whole time and could have spent their time better learning how to build something useful. I'd, rather than program a kit thing to jump on an iPad. I can't help but like validate a lot of your perspective. It seems like we we are, at least in the context of, of the way that you're framing STEM. I mean, I know that there's like, I've seen STEM kits that don't have anything to do with coding. So like, right. obviously yeah. that's not there's what we're talking about. But to your point, when the, kind of the higher end stuff or like what STEM is kind of being defined as now mm-hmm. is very, very computer based. Right. Um, so I... I align with that. And it does seem like we're leaving the past practical in light of this kind of the shiny new, and there has to be a bridge. There there has to be an understanding of both a, 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 like, and I, and I got through high school without going through woodshop, by the way. I'm uh, really? yeah, it was, I uh, love wood shop. Oh, wor- so glad. Dude, it was the worst decision ever. I've ever, like, I just took computer classes and I found a way to like work my credits through that. I only had to like take drafting. I took oh, gotcha. a drafting class, which I was terrible at and did not try at all. 
uh-huh. like my poor drafting teacher was just that he's just looking at me every time I came in. I like I drew like a stage for a band. There's people like building tractor parts on CAD, and <laughs> built like a piece of plywood on like a little riser. And oh yeah, my final. He's like, you learned nothing. <laughs> hey, it's there, isn't it? Yeah, uh, no, but you know, it's it's funny. That was actually one of the first places that I saw something similar, like a, a like a three D printer. Because oh like, yeah, I mean, uh, two thousand and four maybe, but they were mm-hmm. doing some cool things with shapes. And I can't remember if they were actually like doing three D printing or if they were doing like making parts and pieces or um, like conceptual models for things. They were pretty straightforward, real rough cut. But I remember somebody brought something like that into the classroom, and I was like what is going on here? Oh, so the, these were models sitting on the wall or something that somebody else was working on there? No, somebody actually brought like a piece of equipment in. Oh. And I don't know exactly how it did, whatever it did, but like this was this was like 2004 and it was like supposed uh-huh. to be like this thing. Like it, and maybe I'm misremembering, but like I just remembered it was making a part or it was doing a thing. And it was- Okay. And I was in high school. Yeah. Um, so- I don't know. I didn't really think about that before until I just started rambling about it. So uh, uh-huh. my memory probably isn't serving me very well. But um, <laughs> I, I just remember being like interested in it, but also thinking like, there's no way that I'm ever going to do freaking anything with this in life. Like I'm never going to interact with this. I, uh-huh. I I don't, it doesn't interest me. I'm not, you know. Yeah. Which is totally fine. Yeah. More people should be willing to do that as opposed to getting caught in some terrible thing that they everybody's told them they need to do. Yeah. Oddly enough, I end up going to a school for supply chain and then, um, you know, now you're in factories all the time looking at things. Yeah. (laughs) So so, I think what you're saying is like, if if, like advice to a parent, don't feel the pressure of, of defining STEM as the way that STEM is defined. Like it's, it's just be, be tactical, touch things, talk about the way things are built, go build things. Um, but look at the world, as a like how did we get this finished product or this finished good and if there's some coding involved in that great but maybe don't, sure. don't put all the emphasis on that exactly yeah it's 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 overemphasized right at the moment which yeah. is evident by the fact of just covid right there we just lost a hundred thousand truckers because there's nobody who can drive a truck and you can't find anybody to work in a factory to build anything useful because everybody during COVID, everybody who could do that just retired, and there's not a replace yeah. lot of replacement going on. I, got, I, got, I was so. at a, I was at a guy's house the other night. Uh, he just built a new house out here, and he's, he's he drive up to his place. He's got a, a semi like parked out in front of his place, and yeah, I go, hey man, like what, like what are you driving trucks now? And he goes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I quit my job to drive trucks because uh-huh. nobody's driving trucks right now. <laughs> it's like, pretty good business to be in right 100%. now. A hundred percent. Hey, um, I've got an Elon Musk head yeah. right here. This is 3D printed. Anybody who's watching the YouTube, uh, uh, check it out. If you're listening uh, to the uh, to the audio, go to YouTube. Make sure you hit that subscribe button while you're out there, by the way. But um, this yeah, is freaking Elon. cool, man. Like printing, sure. printing faces. Now your company does this as well. So like, help me understand, help me understand that. Like the slant 3d ecosystem where you're making like consumer facing products or, or things like this, like is angled is what it's called. Angled. Yeah. Angled okay. IO. Um, slant 3d. What our goal has always been is to, like I say, make this digital warehouse. Basically what that becomes is a manufacturing backend. Whereas here, if you're building a website today, you'll probably build it on top of Google or Amazon servers, and they build all the machinery and stuff to run those servers to run your website, and you pay them a nickel a month for however much data you're using. We want to do that for manufacturing, to where if you want to make something and sell something and manufacture something, you just upload your code in the form of a 3D model, and then when somebody orders it, our server farm, which is 3D printers, produces it and delivers it to the, your, cons- your users. Um, so it digitizes all of manufacturing and makes us invisible. Just the man behind the curtain making stuff appear and show up the same way somebody figures out how to make your YouTube video show up for you when you're watching that. Yeah. Um, part of that is we have to prove it out because a lot of people are not using that type of service or looking for that type of service right now. So angled is a marketplace. Um, 
where anybody who has a design is able to upload a 3D model of their product. And then we will stick it on the site and anybody else in the world who wants to buy that thing um, can purchase it. And then once they purchase it, a machine will fire up and within about 24 hours, the part will be done and it'll ship in about two days. So it didn't exist. That part didn't exist until the person actually ordered it. And then a machine fired up, grew it out of nothing and we ship it out. And demoing that model where you can just upload digital versions of a real physical thing and then people can buy the real physical thing. And then you just make a margin because somebody- you just make a margin. Yeah. yeah. Some, or the designer is... makes a royalty off yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, it's a whole new thing that people aren't used to. And since there was nobody out there trying to do it, that we could just say, we'll be the printer farm for you. We had to build it ourselves, <laughs> kind of like all the rest of this stuff. Um, so we built this to show that 3D printing can produce parts on demand as fast as other companies can pull them from a shelf in a warehouse. Because we're shipping within two days, that's about as fast as some of your Amazon packages are showing up right now. And we'll be able to get a little bit faster here as time goes by. Um, so getting to that point where nothing exists until somebody actually wants it mm. um, has been the next challenge for us. And Angled is the main demo spot for that. That's freaking cool, man. Well, I'm... Uh... You know, I uh, was searching for like cool headphone stands, like because yeah. I, I wanted I want to do something with these when I'm not on the podcast. And I keep laying them on the desk and terrible. Yeah, it's just a pain. <laughs> and then you know, all of a sudden, I see these like 3D printed heads, and I'm like, man, I wonder if I wonder if Gabe's company does that too. Um, mm -hmm. And then I go to Angle, and then I'm like, oh my god, there's like a whole bunch of them. Like they, yep. yeah, of course, I'm gonna buy my 3D printed head from you. Um, and so Elon Musk, uh, for those yes. of you who don't know, Elon Musk is my headphone stand and the richest man in the world holds my, holds my headphones for me when I'm not, uh, when I'm not podcasting. Satisfying, isn't it? So, satisfying. <laughs> so you've got to have some leadership lessons along the way or some, uh, you know, some entrepreneurial lessons along the way. Um, as we're starting to wind down here, man, I'd love for you to unpack some of those things. So like this journey, this process to building a, a additive manufacturing at scale, uh, uh -huh. using 3d printers. Like what, what's that like, man? It sucks all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dude, you know, always, yeah, exactly. Once you get kind of the, past the romanticism of like entrepreneurship and building a company and all that kind of stuff, which is fine. And lasts about like the first three months until you get kicked in the balls about four more times. Oh, I love um, that. and then you're like, well, this is just awful. Why the hell did I do this? <laughs> um, so it's, it, it, it sucks a lot of the time, but there's those, there's those wins that keep you going. Um, is it like golf? It's like, yeah, you're playing around a golf, you, you hit that yeah. one putt or that one drive and you're like, that's why yeah. I came out here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That one little high note of the whole 18 holes yeah. where you're like, yeah, I'm going to do this all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, it, if I was looking for like lessons or something, I, people have called it grit. I would just call it time because you're outlasting someone else. I mean, you're in competition with other people and that kind of thing, but very often you're just outlasting them. Can you make fewer mistakes than somebody else who's doing the same thing? And can you do it for longer? Um, literally, I think if anybody can pursue a business for like three years, you'll be successful, moderately successful. It'll be solid. And if you can pursue it for five, you'll be rich. And if you pursue it for 10, you'll be really rich. That seems to be what I've observed from other people who have been successful in business. Um, just, go. just go and commit to it because very few humans even hold a job for more than two years. But if you stick it out, then you're just already beat 90% of people. If you stick it out for three years. And then if you stick it out for five, well, most people don't ha hang on for that long. So survive for that long. Um, and then you beat out everybody else who is running alongside you. Yeah. So if you're running a marathon, if there were prizes for running 27 miles rather than just the 26, go be the guy who does 27 and there'll be fewer people at that finish line and then go for the extra mile and so on and so forth. So just outlasting people seems to be the best competitive advantage there is as opposed to just beating it out. If you're in a rush and you're in a sprint, there's a, a fight to be had, but that's, that's a different deal. And so and then, rare. 
what what's the what's the thing through this process that surprised you that you didn't anticipate that you'd be doing or that like would come up as like a thing that's in your life? Well, I didn't think I'd be doing this just as a career wise. Um, uh, Cause yeah, I'm a roboticist. I never thought I'd do anything with 3d printing. Uh, surprise. I'm a grinder. So there's usually not big old step changes all the time. There's just this kind of iterative improvement or changes or things that happen, small things that happen that poke at you. Um, very rarely does a roof fall in or you suddenly skyrocket. Um, so I don't know if there were a lot of surprises outside of the fact that 3D printing presented itself as a, a viable mass production mm -hmm. market opportunity at the time when we were looking at it because I had zero interest in it whatsoever at that time. Um, but then it proved itself out and it became interesting. So the inception of the thing is the most surprising to me. Hell yeah, man. Dude, I am so, I'm so glad you were able to carve out some time with me today. Uh, Appreciate you having me on there. This stuff. Uh, this fun. So, yeah. How, how do people go out and they find you, find your company? Like what's the, what's the easiest ways to do that? I'm most active on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. And you can just Google my name there and I'll pop up probably in the top there somewhere, I imagine. Um, but LinkedIn and that's the, yeah, that's the best way to reach me or get in contact with me or see what we're doing there. And right, then, well, yeah slant3d.com is the company there okay I'll, I'll, I'll put uh, I'll put links to both of those uh, in, in the angled site as well sure. uh, in, in the comments below so if anybody's uh, interested in those things and man I tell you what uh, from the first time that I met you a little over a year and a half ago uh, to uh, to now and I know we've bumped uh, bumped into each other a couple times since then like it's so cool to have uh, a like an innovator like that. I mean, your, your well, print farm is five to six miles away from my house. I, I mean, I live out in Middleton, your facility's yeah. out in Caldwell. Like it's, it's cool, man. And you've walked me around it and it's absolutely blown my mind. Uh, and, well, thank you. and what an honor to be able to, uh, just kind of, kind of poke around and, and see how you think about the whole thing. Well, appreciate it there. Glad it was something useful or interesting there. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, hey, you have a uh, you have an awesome uh, rest of your week, man, and uh, we'll talk soon. You too. Sounds good. See you later. Cheers.